Welcome back. President Trump launching a new commission on election integrity. The move coming after President uh, Trump raised questions about widespread voter fraud in the 2016 election. Chris Kobach is the Kansas Secretary of State and Vice Chairman of the new Presidential Commission on Election Integrity. Sir, it's good to have you on the program this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to be with you. Happy Mother's Day. That's you. Tell us what you're looking at and, and how you believe you can actually get to the bottom of this, whether or not there was a widespread fraud. So the uh, commission is looking at more than just the 2016 election. It's looking at the entire issue of voting irregularities and fraud and, and registration problems. So what we'll be doing is for the first time in our country's history, we'll be gathering data from all 50 states and we'll be using the federal government's databases, which can be very valuable. The Social Security Administration has data on people when they pass away. Um, the Department of Homeland Security knows of the millions of aliens who are in the United States legally. And that's data that's never been bounced against the state's voter rolls to see whether these people are registered. So uh, we'll be doing things like that that have never been done before. And we'll try to get some numbers, some actual statistics, because, you know, this debate is so contentious. But oftentimes the debate doesn't have enough facts uh, in, the, in the debate. And we're going to be providing those facts, putting them on the table and letting the people decide and going where the facts take us. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's terrific that you're doing this, uh, especially after all of the conversations surrounding this issue in the last couple of elections. Let me ask you, wh how do they do it? Somebody dies and then they just get their name they, and they use their identity. How do they do it? What, what's the, the typical track that these people are, are taking? You know, I think voting the names of deceased people, although that's, you know, sort of the subject of lore in Chicago and places you, you hear about people talking about that, I think that's one of the less frequent forms of voter fraud, but I could be wrong. We'll find out. But the way that would happen is uh, a person dies, for whatever reason, the county doesn't know that, and the name remains on the voter roll, and then somebody, uh, it's a matter of public record, the, the voter roll, somebody discovers that so-and-so's name is still on the voter roll, and then, then if it's a state without photo ID, they can just walk up and say, I am that person. But the more common forms of voter fraud, I think the most common that I have seen in Kansas is double voting, people voting twice in the same election, either in Kansas and in another state or in two different counties of Kansas. Well, you can also argue that what we've been talking about in terms of spying on, on people is also a, a form of voter fraud, right? I mean, we've just been talking about this situation where Rand Paul says he was surveilled and another senator has, uh, has confided in him that he, too, was spied on by the Obama administration, reading the records of their phone calls and their correspondence, etc. Doesn't that fall under the umbrella of voter fraud during the election? It, it, it might very well be a crime, and it, it certainly is in the, the cases you've described, but, it, well, depending on the, the circumstances of whether, he had, you know, whether there was consent and who was doing the spying. But um, in, we usually don't define those as voter crimes. You're right that it might have some indirect effect on an election. But the voter crimes are classically ones where you're trying to uh, vote in somebody else's name, you're trying to alter a ballot, you're trying to commit vote by mail fraud. That the, we'll be looking at you know, the things that are classically defined as election fraud. Well, Secretary, what, what about, for example, the IRS targeting conservatives? I mean, the IRS was targeting conservatives, right? And, and we know that John Koskinen is still in charge of the IRS. A lot of people scratching their heads about that one. How is he still in that job after we know that he targeted conservatives? Is that under the umbrella of voter fraud? Uh, probably not, because again, and, and, and by the way, these are great topics that you know, may be deserving of their own commission to look into it. But uh, the subject of voter fraud is, is itself pretty vast. I mean, you, you're talking about maybe eight or ten different forms of fraud. We'll also be looking at the effect on voter participation. You know, one of the arguments you hear from people who oppose things like photo ID, which we have here in Kansas, is they say, well, it d depresses participation rates. We haven't seen that in Kansas, but we'll look at the evidence from the other 49 states and see what it shows. Well, I don't so understand we're, we're trying that. to keep well, it, you know. How is it possible that in some areas of the country you don't need an ID to vote? I mean, you need an ID yeah. for everything. You need an ID to buy a beer, and you don't need your ID to, to, to participate in a presidential election? I agree. I mean, look, you need an ID to get on a plane. You need an ID to enter a federal building, to open a checking account. Exactly. You pretty much need a photo ID to For function everything. in American society. You even need, you need one to buy the kind of Sudafed that works, too, if you get a cold. So how I did mean, that fly? So yeah, we, how, we, how did that even fly? That, oh, okay, we're going to use, we're going to do away with IDs, and, and, and that's politically incorrect. I don't even understand the thinking. 
Well, so you know, what happened in most states is they didn't have an ID requirement for the, you know, the early years of the 20th century going all the way into the 1980s. Um, and then states started realizing that voter fraud was happening. And so state by state, we started adopting it. So now you've got about a dozen states like Kansas that have a very strict photo ID requirement. Then you've got another maybe six or eight states that have ones with loopholes in them. And then there's a whole bunch of states. In fact, the majority still don't have it. And our Constitution allows the states to define the rules of voting. I, I, you know, we'll see if more states adopt it, and maybe this commission can shed some, shed some light on the subject. When are you expecting to uh, report your findings, sir? We're expecting to do so in a year, so next spring, maybe May, but the commission stays in existence for up to two years. So if for some reason we have to go later, we can, but our hope is one year. An early, early look at, at, at what you will produce. Can you give an expectation of, of where you're going to be uh, providing some evidence? Well, I can't forecast what the conclusions would be, but I can give you some idea of what we might do. So one thing that's never been done before that I alluded to earlier is um, the Department of Homeland Security has a database of all known aliens, green card holders, temporary visas holders in the United States, and that has never been bounced against the state's voter rolls to say, well, hey, how many of these people with this name, this date of birth, uh, so you can get an exact match, how many of them are registered to vote in state A or state B? Uh, we can do something like that, again, which will be very informative, and I don't know what the results will yield, but I know that, for example, in Kansas, we have seen a large number of non-citizens registered on our voter rolls, and that's one of the subjects we're actually locked in battle with the ACLU in court wow. right now, yeah. because we, we require proof of citizenship in our state. Great. Well, very informative indeed. Chris Kovac, come back soon. We'll be watching the developments. Thanks so much.